Report. Here's Savannah Guthrie. Hi, everybody. Good morning. As we come on the air, we await any moment now a public statement from Robert Mueller, the special counsel who was appointed to look into Russian interference in the 2016 presidential election. His report has been out in public for several weeks now, but this is the first uh, we've heard morning, him speak. Everyone, and Let's listen. Thank you for being here. Two years ago, the acting attorney general asked me to serve as special counsel, and he created the special counsel's office. The appointment order directed the office to investigate Russian interference in the 2016 presidential election. This included investigating any links or coordination between the Russian government and individuals associated with the Trump campaign. Now, I have not spoken publicly during our investigation. I'm speaking out today because our investigation is complete. The Attorney General has made the report on our investigation largely public. We are formally closing the Special Counsel's Office, and as well, I'm resigning from the Department of Justice to return to private life. I'll make a few remarks about the results of our work, but beyond these few remarks, it is important that the Office's written work speak for itself. Let me begin where the appointment order begins, and that is interference in the 2016 presidential election. As alleged by the grand jury in an indictment, Russian intelligence officers, who were part of the Russian military, launched a concerted attack on our political system. The indictment alleges that they used sophisticated cyber techniques to hack into computers and networks used by the Clinton campaign. They stole private information and then released that information through fake online and identities and through the organization WikiLeaks. The releases were designed and timed to interfere with our election and to damage a presidential candidate. And at the same time as the grand jury alleged in a separate indictment, a private Russian entity engaged in a social media operation where Russian citizens posed as Americans in order to influence an, an election. These indictments contain alleg allegations, and we are not co commenting on the guilt or the innocence of any specific defendant. Every defendant is presumed innocent unless and until proven guilty. The indictments allege, and the other activities in our report describe, efforts to interfere in our political system they needed to be investigated and understood, and that is among the reasons why the Department of Justice established our office. That is also a reason we investigated efforts to obstruct the investigation. The matters we investigated were of paramount importance. It was critical for us to obtain full and accurate information from every person we questioned. When a subject of an investigation obstructs that investigation, or lies to investigators, it strikes at the core of their government's effort to find the truth and hold wrongdoers accountable. Let me say a word about the report. The report has two parts, addressing the two main issues we were asked to investigate. The first volume of the report details numerous efforts emanating from Russia to influence the election. This volume includes a discussion of the Trump campaign's response to this activity, as well as our conclusion that there was insufficient evidence to charge a broader conspiracy. And in the second volume, the report describes the results and analysis of our obstruction of justice investigation involving the president. The order appointing me special counsel authorized us to investigate actions that could obstruct the investigation. And we conducted that investigation and we kept the office of the acting attorney general apprised of the progress of our work. And as set forth in the report after that investigation, if we had had confidence that the president clearly did not commit a crime, we would have said so. We did not, however, make a determination as to whether the president did commit a crime. The introduction to the volume two of our report explains that decision. 
It explains that under long-standing department policy, a president cannot be charged with a federal crime while he is in office. That is unconstitutional. Even if the charge is kept under seal and hidden from public view, that too is prohibited. The special counsel's office is part of the Department of Justice, and by regulation, it was bound by that department policy. Charging the president with a crime was therefore not an option we could consider. The department's written opinion explaining the policy makes several important points that further informed our handling of the obstruction investigation. Those points are summarized in our report, and I will describe two of them for you. First, the opinion explicitly permits the investigation of a sitting president because it is important to preserve evidence while memories are fresh and documents available. Among other things, that evidence could be used if there were co-conspirators who could be charged now. And second, the opinion says that the Constitution requires a process other than the criminal justice system to formally accuse a sitting president of wrongdoing. And beyond department policy, we were guided by principles of fairness. It would be unfair to potentially it would be unfair to potentially accuse somebody of a crime when there can be no court resolution of the actual charge. So that was Justice Department policy. Those were the principles under which we operated. And from them, we concluded that we would, would not reach a determination one way or the other about whether the president committed a crime. That is the office's, that is the office's final position and we will not comment on any other conclusions or hypotheticals about the president. We conducted an independent criminal investigation and reported the results to the Attorney General, as required by department regulations. The Attorney General then concluded that it was appropriate to provide our report to Congress and to the American people. At one point in time, I requested that certain portions of the report be released the Attorney General preferred to, make that, preferred to make the entire report public all at once. And we appreciate that the Attorney General made the report largely public. And I certainly do not question the Attorney General's good faith in that decision. Now, I hope and expect this to be the only time that I will speak to you in this manner. I am making that decision myself. No one has told me whether I can or should testify or speak further about this matter. There has been discussion about an appearance before Congress. Any testimony from this office would not go beyond our report. It contains our findings and analysis and the reasons for the decisions we made. We chose those words carefully and the work speaks for itself. And the report is my testimony. I would not provide information beyond that which is already public in any appearance before Congress. In addition, access to our underly, underlying work product is being decided in a process that does, that does not involve our office. So beyond what I've said here today and what is contained in our written work, I do not believe it is appropriate for me to speak further about the investigation or to comment on the actions of the Justice Department or Congress. And it's for that reason I will not be taking questions today as well. Now, before I step away, I want to thank the attorneys, the FBI agents, the analysts, the professional staff who helped us conduct this investigation in a fair and independent manner. These individuals who spent nearly two years with the special counsel's office were of the highest integrity. And I will close by reiterating the central allegation of our indictments that there were multiple systematic efforts to interfere in our election. And that allegation deserves the attention of every American. Thank you. Thank you for being here today. Special Counsel Robert sure, Mueller at the Justice Department uh, just giving his first and what he says will be his only public remarks. 
on the almost two-year investigation he conducted into Russia's interference into the 2016 election. Importantly, he emphasized the aspect of the report that dealt with whether or not President Trump obstructed justice in this matter. He said, as the report said, if they had evidence that the president did not commit a crime, that the report would have said so. He emphasized that it didn't say so. And he emphasized that he and the office were bound by longstanding Department of Justice policy that states a sitting president cannot be indicted. He indicated that the Constitution provides for other means for dealing with the president in these circumstances. And most importantly, he has asserted that he will not testify before Congress. I want to go to Pete Williams, who was in that room. He's on the seventh floor of the Justice Department this morning. Um, Pete, he didn't go outside the report. He also has said he doesn't want to testify before Congress. It may be that Congress itself has a say in that. How do you expect this to play out? Well, this was his valedictory speech, I think. You know, really, it was a formal end to the investigation. He decided he did want to make a public statement. Most of it, you're right, was a summary of this written report. Uh, but what he did say is nobody has told me whether or not I can or should testify before Congress. Uh, so that clearly is up to him. And he said if he does testify, though, don't get your hopes up. He's not going to go beyond what's in the four corners of his report. And he also said, I think it's interesting, you know, the special counsel's office basically as of today ceases to exist. It, it largely ceased to exist several weeks ago when the report itself was turned in, but he was still doing some mopping up work. But now any any discussion between Congress and the Justice Department about whether and if the underlying materials that his people gathered will be available, he's going to be out of that entirely. He's going to go back to being a private citizen. Um, so he's not going to be involved in that. I didn't hear him to say he's not going to testify. What I heard him to say is it's his decision alone. And uh, if he is, it's not going to be very spectacular. Well, right. He, what he said is, I don't believe it would be appropriate to speak further. The fact of the matter, as you well know, is that the Congress does have the power of subpoena. So it may force the issue. But it is very clear, as I turn to Casey Hunt, who covers Capitol Hill for us, that Robert Mueller is trying to say to Congress, you are barking up the wrong tree if you try to force this. I'm not going to say anything outside what is in that report. You can fight over the underlying materials. But uh, I I'm not your guy if you're looking to have me come up here on Capitol Hill and testify. And Savannah, this had been what we had been hearing from the committee in the weeks leading up to this uh, momentous statement today, that Robert Mueller seemed reluctant to participate in what would be most likely a public spectacle, because really, uh, you know, he has been saying, as he underscored in public for the first time today, that the report does speak for itself, and therefore any value that would be added by him coming before cameras uh, would really be dramatic, as opposed to being sub and adding to the record of what we know here. But Savannah, you hit on exactly what is the big question. And uh, I've already put this to sources on Capitol Hill uh, to see whether or not the House Judiciary Committee is going to send Robert Mueller a subpoena. We have seen the Trump administration obviously flout subpoenas left and right, refuse to cooperate with Congress. But as we heard, Robert Mueller, now a private citizen uh, and also somebody who is a very careful observer and followers of the norms, rules and practices that govern how all of this is supposed to unfold. I think he underscored that himself I and mean, we had been reporting it extensively throughout the course of this investigation. But you heard him make reference to it as well in, in describing uh, how he made his decision about whether or not uh, they could charge the president of the United States with a crime. So I do think you're going to see potentially a different set of circumstances play out in the event that Congress does send Robert Mueller a subpoena. So again, we don't yet have an answer to this critical question, but of course, House Democrats, Democrats control the House of Representatives. They control the gavels uh, in those committees. And, and frankly, our, our eyes are turned uh, toward what they are going to do next in terms of trying to get more answers, Savannah. Now, let me go to Chuck Todd, who's with you there in Washington. This is going to be a, a, a matter of, of analyzing what Robert Mueller chose to emphasize from his report. He gives a nine-minute statement, and what he chose to, to highlight is important. One of the things he mentions 
and goes out, out of his way to say is that this DOJ opinion that says you can't indict, you can't criminally charge a sitting president, says that the Constitution requires a process other than the criminal justice system to formally accuse a sitting president of wrongdoing. He's, without using that word, reminding folks that there is a process and it's called impeachment. Well, Savannah, I think that's the, that's the news out of here, is that he... In case anybody wasn't sure what, how to interpret the introduction to part two of the Mueller report, Robert Mueller now told you how to interpret it, which is simply this report, it's up to you, Congress. You're the only one that can make the decision about whether or not a crime was committed here. This, the Constitution essentially doesn't permit the normal uh, process. So in, in, in some ways, this is a rebuttal to Barr. And I think the single most important sentence, sentence he uttered is this. We chose the words carefully, meaning about the report itself, but that's also about Mueller's statement today. He chose his words carefully. Notice how he described part one. Bill Barr described it as a total exoneration. He said insufficient evidence to charge a broader conspiracy, right? How you choose to word something says a lot, if you will. This is Bob Mueller simply saying, there wasn't enough to charge a crime here. That doesn't mean there wasn't behavior, perhaps, that we found suspicious. But I think the larger headline in this is Bob Mueller is making it crystal clear to Congress. I did this report assuming this was your call, not the Justice Department's call. This was your call. I think he basically said it pretty straightforwardly. Well, it's interesting because there had been some confusion, as you well know, Chuck, about this issue of right. why Robert Mueller chose not to make a prosecutorial decision, why he chose not to say whether or not the president could be charged with obstruction of justice. Bill Barr, the attorney general, when initially announcing the results of the Mueller report, said that he concluded there was no obstruction of justice case, and he said that had nothing to do with that Department right. of Justice rule that states you can't indict <laughs> right. a sitting president. But Robert Mueller has made crystal clear today that he was, in fact, bound by and guided by that Department of Justice rule that says a sitting president may not be criminally prosecuted. That and is he, what he said in black and white. I, it seems like he wanted to make sure that that issue had been settled. I, and not only that, I thought it was interesting how he chose, how he cho where he chose to praise the attorney general. And he said... He largely released the report, uh, and and we we are glad he did uh, made uh, we, we glad he did that in that decision. You know, it was basically ignoring part one of what Barr did. But in some ways, and and I perhaps I'm giving a hint of what I think you're going to see a lot on cable today. Take Bill Barr and take Robert Mueller, and basically put them side by side. How Barr interpreted the report and how Mueller basically it's a rebuttal. And it's, it, this is the statement, I think, that he thought a neutral attorney general would have given had they read the report the way Mueller intended for the report to be read. Well, let's go to Peter Alexander, who's at the White House. And, of course, Peter, we recall that many at the White House were stating that the Mueller report was a complete exoneration. Yep. Uh, now we're hearing from Robert Mueller. How do you think this is going to go over at the White House today? Well, Savannah, I think you put your finger on it right there. With every megaphone the president had by Twitter, uh, through placards on podiums, and through comments of his aides and advisors, the president, for the course of the last month and a half, has tried to basically make that case that this is a total exoneration. Well, now very clearly from Robert Mueller, we heard, in effect, a different story. He said, by not charging Donald Trump, they're not saying that he didn't commit crimes, just that they are not going to pursue him for the potential that he committed any crimes, which now leaves it to Congress. The president, in the course of the last month and a half, has tweeted Robert Mueller's name more than 70 times. On Friday, he said it would be ridiculous that Mueller would testify. So I think the White House will be happy to hear that this may be the final word from Robert Mueller, but it's certainly not the word that they were hoping to hear today. In my conversations with aides over the course of this day, we got the indication that the White House was notified, notified that Mueller would make a statement today. They learned about it last night. The president was notified as well, but there was no indication that they knew exactly what he would say. And in the conversations going into this, they seemed to indicate they thought he would resign from the Department of Justice, from the special counsel's office, that he would be shutting it down as he announced, but that the focus would be heavily on that and on the fact that he wouldn't testify. They were, in effect, 
trying to steer clear of what seems to be the real headline that came out of this today. The president has no scheduled uh, public events today. He has some private meetings with the secretary of state, with the vice president. So there was no opportunity, at least to this point, for reporters to press the president on his findings here. But it certainly does complicate the argument that he has been making what he and his allies have been insisting would be their argument for the course of the campaign, that he has been totally exonerated here when Robert Mueller said, in fact, there is no exoneration. Lots to chew over here. Uh, let's talk to Andrea Mitchell, who covers foreign affairs. And the first part of Mueller's statement in, also can be interpreted to say he was justifying the whole purpose and the genesis of this Russia investigation in the first place. He talked about the investigation establishing that an arm of the Russian military and intelligence services of Russia had interfered in the election, had a hacking campaign, that there was a private Russian entity that had engaged in a social media influence campaign. And he said these matters uh, needed to be investigated and understood. In, in a way, it felt like he was trying to justify why it was that the special counsel was appointed in the first place. Absolutely. And I think he uh, may be signaling that he feels that not enough attention was paid to that first section with all of the uh, reports from the White House and the president, of course, specifically saying no collusion, that he wanted to emphasize that, as he said, every American should be concerned about this attack. He went into more detail than one might expect in this statement about that original indictment against the Russians a uh, year ago, June. I also think it's very important to emphasize that he said, I hope and expect that this will be the only time that I speak to you in this manner. And he is saying that the report is his testimony. He's saying to the Congress, as, as you've noted, that he does not want to appear and that he will not go beyond the four corners of his report. And so it is now going to be conflicting pressure, of course. Uh, a lot of people in the Democratic Party in particular are going to be demanding that they force a subpoena, to force him to appear, to push this as far as they can. But others will say that this is an unnecessary piling on and that, in fact, he will not go beyond it. So it would just be the political spectacle that he has certainly signaled he does not want to participate in. I think it's very significant that he spoke so clearly about saying also that he did not find that the president did not... Uh, did not commit a crime. He's just saying that they did not conclude anything because of those regulations and that practice that the president cannot be indicted and it would be unfair to even have a sealed indictment uh, that the only reason to have the investigation, that there's pl plenty of reason to have the investigation to preserve the testimony while it is still fresh and to preserve the possibility of using it against co-conspirators, Savannah. And he went step further, one step further, Andrea, as you know, he said if we could have concluded and, and cleared him exactly. of a crime, we would have done so. But we didn't do that. Uh, let's play a little bit of Robert Mueller's speech a few minutes ago. Take a listen. And as set forth in the report, after that investigation, if we had had confidence that the president clearly did not commit a crime, we would have said so. We did not, however, make a determination as to whether the president did commit a crime. The introduction to the volume two of our report explains that decision. It explains that under long-standing department policy, a pres president cannot be charged with a federal crime while he is in office. That is unconstitutional. Even if the charge is kept under seal and hidden from public view, that too is prohibited. The special counsel's office is part of the Department of Justice, and by regulation, it was bound by that department policy. Charging the president with a crime was therefore not an option we could consider. Let's go to Pete Williams, our justice correspondent, who's made his way outside uh, the department there in Washington, D.C. Pete, as you've had a chance to marinate in this statement, what are you uh, reflecting on? What do you think are the takeaways? Well, a couple of things. First of all, uh, talking to some members of his staff who were in the room to hear this uh, valedictory speech by Mueller, uh, it's quite clear that he has no intention, just to be clear, I think you picked this up, he has no intention of testifying before Congress. He said, this report is my testimony. And he said, I hope and expect this is the only time I will speak about this matter. So no question, he does not want to testify before Congress. You may have heard there was a question shouted to him as he walked away, what if you're subpoenaed? And he said, no questions. Secondly, uh, 
fundamentally, there is nothing in his remarks here that goes beyond what the report said. So all of the discussion you've been having about the fact that uh, Mueller said, you know, we can't say the president didn't commit a crime, that's in the report. Uh, so that remark does not go beyond the report. The, the only thing that I think is new here is, and this gets a little bit processy, but the only thing I think is new is when the special counsel staff made the decision that they would not say whether or not the president committed a crime, that they would not reach a conclusion about that. And the answer is, from the beginning, he said uh, that because it would be unconstitutional to charge a president with a crime, charging the president with a crime was therefore not an option we could consider. So one of the puzzles to us has been, what did they do? Did they assemble all the evidence and then say, okay, let's decide whether the president committed a crime? Oops, we can't do that because we're not allowed to. That didn't come at the end, that came at the beginning. But nonetheless, he said, as the report says, we concluded we couldn't do this investigation because, in essence, a president isn't president forever. And if there were a crime, then someone theoretically could be charged after they leave office. But I think the only thing that I picked up here new was this sense that the going in proposition was they knew they couldn't charge the president with a crime if they had found the evidence to indicate that he did so. They never did that calculus. But on the other hand, he said today, as the report says, that they also aren't saying that they could they couldn't that they, they can't say that he didn't commit a crime that they couldn't exonerate him. Well, it, exactly. So that is interesting. So they knew from the get go, we're never going to render a prosecutorial decision against the president because we are forbidden from doing because so. We can't. We're employees of the Justice Department right. is essentially what he said. But then he went on to say you can investigate because we need to preserve evidence to your point, because the president isn't president forever, if there is a criminal case perhaps to be brought. And then he mentioned, Pete, uh, this, this business about how Congress, uh, excuse me, the Constitution has another process to deal with the president in these circumstances. Let's go to Mimi Roca, uh, who is our legal analyst for NBC News. And Mimi, it, Pete is very, very correct there. there. Mueller didn't go outside the four squares of this report in anything that he said. On the other hand, it's a matter of emphasis and what he chose to highlight. What do you make of what he chose to single out today in his final and only comments on the matter, if he can help it? Yeah, I mean, on the one hand, he didn't go outside the report. On the other hand, what he did is so valuable and I think shows why it would be valuable if he testified before Congress, even if he only talked about what's in the report, because the report is dense and he's walking us through it. Here he did it in eight or nine minutes. He highlighted, first of all, something that we know because we've read the report, but maybe not everybody does because it's been sort of obfuscated by um, allies of Trump, frankly, and Trump himself, that Russia attacked our election. They interfered in, quote, a systematic way. Boom. That's it. That's important. And he's telling Americans, pay attention to that. Don't let that go by. Second, he said, here's why obstruction of justice is important to investigate. It strikes at the heart of our justice system. You cannot let those crimes go unattended, uninvestigated. Third, he said, without saying it explicitly the way that we've been saying it, but he made very clear that the president was not charged with a crime because he couldn't be, but that there is substantial evidence of obstruction of justice. He also said, with respect to the Trump campaign, that he didn't find uh, evidence to charge a prosecutable crime against members of the campaign with Russia's interference. He didn't say anything about no collusion. And I think that's important because remember, after Barr's letter came out, before the report came out, the talking point became and still has been no collusion. And Mr. Mueller did not say that he didn't find collusion because that is not what he was looking for. So I think all of these points are really important that he chose to emphasize. And even if they're in the report, it shows the importance of walking the American public through these very basic points. And I hope that now Congress picks up that mantle more 
and does it in a more effective way. And I think that's what Mueller was asking them to do. Well, that brings us from the lawyers, uh, the expert in the law to the expert in politics, which is Chuck Todd. And Chuck, what do Democrats do now? Because, you know, the issue yeah. is whether they want to force it with Mueller. Mueller could not have been clearer that he has no desire to testify before Congress. He has said there's nothing to see here. The report speaks for itself. The report is my testimony, he said today. But Congress does have the power of the subpoena and can try to force it. Well, they can, but I think the larger issue they got to deal with is this, right? Nancy Pelosi politically doesn't want to do impeachment. I think she's trying to buy time, get to the end of the summer and say, you know what? The presidential campaign is too far along. This is not healthy for the country. Let's let the election and we'll sort this out. Except she's got a problem now politically, Savannah, and that is this. Yesterday, you had a Republican member of Congress. Granted, it's somebody that's sort of seen as is sort of out on his own island at times, Justin Amash, making the clearest case for impeachment that any member of Congress makes right now, and it happens to be a Republican. And now you have Robert Mueller, right, who speaks for the first time, who you who what and and, and again what everybody's noted here, what he chose to point out, his basically direct rebuttal to Bill Barr's characterization of everything Barr has done to this point. And him explicitly saying he believed only Congress could make this decision. So now there isn't a question of did Mueller intend Congress to do it? Mueller has said, I intended you to make this decision. And now you have Nancy Pelosi having to face the fact that she's got a, a growing chorus of Democrats that say it's time to impeach. And the person making the clearest case publicly is a Republican member of Congress. Mm -hmm. I just think the political pressure now and the leadership of the House to open an impeachment inquiry is only going to increase. Well, that brings us to Pete Williams, who's at the Justice Department. I know you wanted to get in on this issue of impeachment. Mueller didn't flat out say Congress is up to you, but he did point out that, that the Constitution provides a remedy, um, in the, in, and it's over to Congress, which, of course, refers to the impeachment process. Yeah, process. Process, process is the word he used. I'm looking at the uh, text of his remarks now. The opinion says, this is quoting now, the opinion says that the Constitution requires a process other than the criminal justice system to formally accuse a sitting president of wrongdoing. I just think it's interesting that he put that sentence in. Yes, this was a, uh, an eight minute or so thing, but there's a lot he didn't say. This he chose to say. And in, et in essence, it's just a line and a footnote in this 400 plus page report. So the fact that he chose to say it, I think, is interesting. It's an insight that it was very much on the minds of Mueller's staff. Um, the only other point I wanted to make, Savannah, and I want to be as careful about this as I can. You know, I've covered Robert Mueller since he was um, uh, uh, the FBI director, uh, held over for 12 years, kept tabs with him in the past. Um, we've all aged since then. He's now 74. And I did think today that... Um, you know, that, that may be a question on his mind as well. Uh, you know, at this point in his life, at this stage in his life, he's finished his job as special counsel. Uh, he wants to put it beyond him now, I think, and, and move on. Well, he certainly has been at the, the red hot center of political life for the last couple of years. And he said he wants to return to private life. We'll see if Congress lets him. Robert Mueller this morning at the Justice Department for the first time addressing his almost two-year Russia investigation, talking about what his report concluded, what it found, and what it could not find. And he has now, um, by his remarks, set off another round of speculation about whether or not Congress will pick up where he left off. That question is also re regards his testimony as well. He has said he does not want to testify before Congress and that it would be fruitless for him to do so. But now we will hear from members of Congress. We expect to hear a little bit later today from the Democratic chairman of the House Judiciary Committee about what his next move will be. And of course, watching all of this from the White House, the president, who obviously has a stake in all of this. We will continue to follow this. I'll be back with full details tonight on NBC Nightly News. For now, I'm Savannah Guthrie, NBC News in New York. Have a good day. Most of you return to regular programming.
being taken by this. They're bringing it all on board and trying to figure out just how they're going to respond on two fronts, both most immediately, but also how you manage the president's Twitter feed and when he interacts with reporters in many of the impromptu opportunities that he sometimes engages with us. Craig? Hans, out of curiosity, where is the president right now? Well, last I checked, he was not in the West Wing yet. The, the tip for always that is whether or not the president, the Marine Guard, is stationed out front of the West Wing. And so I didn't see a Marine Guard as of 20 minutes ago. Now, I haven't checked recently. Maybe he came in. In the past, the president likes to have what we call executive time upstairs in the residence, talking to sources, talking to friends, advisors, maybe perhaps watching a little cable television. Sometimes you get a sense of what the president is watching based on what he's tweeting. But as of this morning, as of post Mueller, no tweets yet, but I haven't looked at my phone for 30 seconds, so I could be wrong on that. Craig. <laughs> That's right. uh, thank you so much, Hans. Again, let us know if and when yep. we hear something official from the administration, sir. Joined now by Chuck Todd, NBC News political director, moderator of Meet the Press. Chuck, in the last few moments, uh, yeah. speaking of Twitter, we did see this tweet uh, from Congressman Justin Amash. Of course, mm -hmm. Congressman Amash, the only Republican so far who has... Uh, who has uh, called for impeachment. This is the tweet just a few moments ago. The ball is in our court, Congress. Chuck, what, what do we surmise that what we just heard from the special counsel is going to mean uh, for, for more calls for impeachment? Craig, I think that's the headline of this, of this uh, statement by Robert Mueller. The most important thing he clarified was what he meant in the introduction in page two. And he basically, I, I said the most important sentence he said is we chose the words carefully. Uh, he chooses all of his words carefully. He was very careful what to emphasize and what he didn't. And I think it's very, he made it crystal clear. He believed this was not constitutionally a decision that could be made by anybody at the Justice Department, anybody that works for justice. And he believed he worked for justice. That's his way of saying, oh, by the way, hey, Bill Barr, this wasn't your call either. There is only one constitutional place remedy for, for, the, for, for where this call is made, and it's it's Congress. So I think between that, Craig, and the fact that Justin Amash is making the clearest case for opening an impeachment inquiry right now, if you actually think about it, we know there's a group of House Democrats that believe there should be an impeachment inquiry, but who, who actually has laid out um, the reason to do it uh, uh, with more clarity than Justin Amash, both uh, on social media and holding a town hall and, and putting, putting his words out there. I think the political pressure now on the Democratic leadership in the House, I think Speaker Pelosi doesn't want to do impeachment. I think she's been hoping to run out the political calendar clock, if you will, get to the Labor Day and say, you know what, the pre let's, let's get through the presidential, don't distract from that. I think this one-two punch of Amash basically putting himself out there, making this a bipartisan call, and Mueller making it crystal clear what he believed was the, it, it, whose job this is, I, it, it, it's basically Congress, it's now up to you. It's your call. Uh, Chuck, um, again, a reminder for our viewers and our listeners on Sirius Satellite Radio, this is what we heard from Bob Mueller a, a few moments ago as it pertains to the possibility uh, that he might testify before Congress either publicly or privately. Take a listen. I would not provide information beyond that which is already public in any appearance before Congress. In addition, access to our underly, underlying work product is being decided in a process that does, that does not involve our office. So beyond what I've said here today and what is contained in our written work, I do not believe it is appropriate for me to speak further about the investigation or to comment on the actions of the Justice Department or Congress. And it's for that reason I will not be taking questions today as well. Chuck, do you hear that? Mm -hmm. is, is Bob Mueller basically uh, telling the House and the Senate, read the report again? I'm, I'm not showing up to take your questions or be, I, be a part of your political theater? No, I didn't. I, 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 I took it as he didn't want, doesn't want to. Okay. But he did not say he wouldn't. He just essentially said, hey... If you do it, I'm going to bore you to death. I'm just going to read the report. I'm not going to tell you anything I didn't, I didn't already put in the report. I think that was a way of tempering expectations, and I think it's also important, and I don't know if he wanted to lay this more out. I think justice already knew this. The Judiciary Committee already knew this, but if he, they didn't, now they know it for sure. I think it is important that Mueller clarified he has no role 
uh, and being able to even negotiate to provide certain uh, parts of, uh, of the underlying evidence to Congress, which means essentially that's a direct back and forth between the Judiciary Committee and the Department of Justice, i.e. Bill Barr. So, look, I, I didn't hear it as him saying, I'm not testifying. I heard him as saying, I don't want to testify. I don't think I'm going to provide you anything. If you think I'm going to provide you any more insight than I've already done, forget it. But I think there's going to be plenty in Congress who believe Bob Mueller should maybe should be the narrator of his work rather than just reading it, that there is um, that there is a public, uh, that it would play an important role in the public sphere if he essentially narrates his work. So, look, I, I, I suspect we're going to see Bob Mueller testify before Congress. All right, I that, suspect it'll be a, it perhaps the questioning is behind closed doors. It wouldn't surprise me if he could negotiate that. But he's got to be a private citizen. I don't know how much... Uh, how much other than, uh, you know, how much you can negotiate in all this. All right, Ari, stand by one second. We, we do have a, a, a tweet from the president. We also have our justice correspondent, Pete Williams, uh, standing by as well. This is President Trump a few moments ago. Apparently he was, in fact, watching and listening. Quote, nothing changes from the Mueller report. There was insufficient evidence, and therefore, in our country, a person is innocent. The case is closed. Thank you. Our chief legal correspondent standing by. Is, is that how it works? <laughs> well, it, good news. I mean, I, it's a serious day, but the tweet is laughable. Uh, the defendant says the case is closed, if only. Uh, look, as we've reported in the past, there was good news in the Mueller report for Donald Trump, chiefly in the lack of a chargeable election conspiracy. I've said that before, and I'll, I'll say it again in fairness to him. Uh, but no, the case is not closed. As Chuck Todd was just saying, as John Brennan was saying, as other people have said who, who I don't think bring necessarily any assumption about the outcome, the Mueller report stated Congress deals with high crimes by the president. And the only reason that there wasn't, from the beginning, a treatment of whether or not Donald Trump committed a crime was because of the rules of the Justice Department, i.e., the tweet you just read, which we report, of course, what the president says, is false. It is, it is in its substance and essence, false. Now, the other point I wanted to raise, building on what Chuck Todd was, was yeah. telling us, is the Democrats were just told by Bob Mueller that he doesn't have reason at this stage to go and say a lot more in public because the report represents the most careful and clear presentation of his findings. The other way, though, that the country could hear from Bob Mueller, what Chairman Nadler just alluded to, what Justin Amash is talking about, is if there was an actual impeachment probe, not a summary of the report, but an impeachment probe set of hearings or a process to impeach or a collection of evidence or a House vote or a Senate trial. I'm not prejudging whether or not any of those things would happen, but yeah. if they did, yes, you could call in the prosecutor and members of his team to present the evidence because there would be a constitutionally warranted process whereby prosecutors would present evidence. What Mueller is saying is not, is not he'll never talk, I don't think. What he's saying, and I, I think Chuck Todd nailed it, is if asked to talk about the report, he's going to say, well, I'll read the uh, report. did you read it? No. Do you want me to read parts of it? Is this reading Rainbow? Remember, a great show, but Bob Mueller is more serious than that. And so I, I say that deliberately. He's saying this is not reading Rainbow. Yeah. Read the report, decide what to do about it, and if Congress wants to hold an impeachment probe or present evidence, he'll get involved. And I think that is a very key thing today, uh, Craig, because the last thing I'll say, I know you got a lot of guests to get to. Yeah. We have every indication that Bob Mueller wasn't trying to give a televised press conference, wasn't rushing out to speak about this, was hoping the process would work and that Congress would come to a judgment, yes or no. And instead, Congress has done a lot of, well, we might need more from Mueller and it might take more time. And he's put an end to that. The ball is in Congress's court 100 percent today. Uh, Justice correspondent Pete Williams standing by. And Pete, within the last few moments, we have heard from uh, Jerry Nadler, the chairman of the House Judiciary Committee. I will not read his entire statement, but he did say in the last paragraph, although the Department of Justice prevented the special counsel from bringing criminal charges against the president, uh, the special counsel has clearly demonstrated that President Trump is lying about the special counsel's findings, lying about the testimony of key witnesses in the special counsel's report and is lying in saying that the special counsel found no obstruction and no collusion. Given that special counsel Mueller was unable to pursue criminal charges against the president, it falls to Congress to respond to the crimes, lies, and other wrongdoing of President Trump, and we will do so.
Not even the president of the United States is above the law. Uh, Pete, have we heard anything from the Justice Department in response to what we just heard from its special counsel, Robert Mueller? No, didn't expect to. Uh, there's no, there's nothing to respond to uh, from the Justice Department's perspective. He's basically saying, I'm done. I have nothing more to say. A uh, couple of points I think need emphasizing based on what I've been hearing in the past uh, half hour or so. Number one, it's quite clear Mueller does not want to testify before Congress. He made that quite clear. The report is my testimony, he said. You played a short excerpt, but let me back up just a little bit from that. What he said is, I hope and expect that this will be the only time I will speak about this matter. Now, when he first said that, I thought to myself, he means in a forum like this, uh, not necessarily in Congress. But after consulting with some of his folks, uh, he meant that to include his testimony as well. And he said, this is my decision. I made this decision myself. Nobody told me whether I can or should testify or speak further about the matter. So. From his own lips, Bob Mueller does not want to testify before Congress. Will he ultimately agree to do so in a closed session? Perhaps so, with the transcript to be uh, released later. But what he said is, don't get your hopes up. I'm not going to go beyond what's in the report. And as for access to my materials that my staff gathered, that's not my call. That's going to be up to the Justice Department. In essence, he no longer works for the government as of today. That's point one. Point two is, Nothing about how he summarized his report is new. So what the president said today, what Jerry Nadler said, all these other people, they could have said the same thing and in fact largely did after the report itself came out because he added nothing to it, nor did he intend to. I thought what I learned from this is a little more about the process. It did seem to me that he was saying that they made the decision going in that they couldn't charge the president with a crime because it would be unconstitutional. It does seem when you read the report, and you know this has sort of mystified a lot of people, that it does seem like they made the decision at the end, that they gathered all the evidence and they said, okay, now, can we say whether or not any of this evidence constitutes obstruction of justice on the part of the president? I guess we can't, so therefore we can't even decide whether it did. It seems to me that that process is not the way it actually worked, based on what he said today, that that was their going in proposition, that they all were well aware of that. And in fact, one of the people that came to work early on on uh, Mueller's staff in the special counsel's office was Michael Dreeben here from the Solicitor General's office, who's one of the government's leading experts, if not the leading expert on the Constitution. So they clearly were thinking about this question from the very beginning. One other note I would just say. Sure. It's a footnote, a one line and a footnote in the report about this business of whether Congress, this impeachment, he, it didn't use the word, he didn't use the word today, but it did seem interesting to me that in this relatively short summary of a 440 plus page report, he did choose to say this, the opinion, meaning the, uh, the report says the Constitution requires, uh, this means the Justice Department's opinion, on whether you can charge a president requires a process other than the criminal justice system to formally accuse a president of wrongdoing. I did think it was interesting that he chose to put that in there, Craig. Our justice correspondent, uh, Pete Williams, outside the Department of Justice. Pete, thanks as always. Uh, sir, let me bring in Congressman Eric Swalwell now, a Democrat from California, a member of the aforementioned House Judiciary Committee. Uh, he is also a candidate for the 2020 Democratic presidential nomination. Uh, Congressman, thanks for your time. We'll, we'll start with, with what Pete just mentioned there, this idea that Bob Mueller does not want to testify. Do you plan on compelling the special counsel to come before the House Judiciary Committee in a public setting? Good morning, uh, Craig. We're going to hear from Bob Mueller. America needs to hear from Bob Mueller. We paid for this years-long investigation. I, I believe that he ultimately will. I believe he's a patriot. He may be reluctant about it, uh, but seeing is believing. And Mr. Mueller rain, raising his right hand and laying out for the American people what the Russians did to our democracy and what the president and his team did to obstruct an investigation into that attack is critically important. I have full confidence that we will hear from him. Uh, but, but Congressman, we just heard from him, and, and essentially uh, what Bob Mueller seems to be saying is that if, if you call me, I am going to uh, refer you back to my 448-page report. What, what more do you hope to hear from Bob Mueller? 
again, it, it's the difference between, you know, seeing the movie and reading the book. And, you know, people are busy. They're taking their kids to school. They're working hard at their jobs. But the special counsel, a very articulate, experienced prosecutor, can lay out for the American people in his words what the Russians did and what the president did uh, to obstruct. But we also want to get the full report. And if this president is so innocent, so cleared, so exonerated, he needs to let us have 100% of the report because an eighth of it right now is buried beneath the earth. He needs to unearth it and allow Bob Mueller to also speak to that evidence. Uh, what did that, that roughly nine-minute statement from Bob Mueller, what, what did it do for calls from, from folks in your party, uh, those calls for impeachment? It's, it's certainly, I think, will amplify uh, those calls. It's a road that I've always said that we're going to be on and, and end up at anyway. Uh, but taking a step back, Craig, the call that I also heard from Mr. Mueller was for every American to care about what the Russians did. That includes you, Mr. President, because he is the only leader uh, in our country who has not acknowledged uh, what the Russians did to our democracy. I also believe there's a call for future presidents to get rid of the DOJ rule that says a president cannot be indicted. I have said that if I win, day one, I will tell the DOJ to lift that policy. I hope every Democratic nominee makes that pledge. No president should be immunized in the way that this president has been immunized because he would be indicted right now, is what special counsel told us. All right. Uh, our, our moderator of Meet the Press, NBC News political director Chuck Todd, has been standing by. He has been listening to all of this. Uh, Chuck, your, your, your reaction to the reaction? Well, look, I'm not, I'm not surprised. I think, again, I think it's a, you know, I look at this and I think the Democrats do have a dilemma. And I think it's a, I think this isn't um, as easy to be able to sit here and say, oh, geez, if you choose to be in favor of impeachment, you're making a political decision. Or if you choose not to be in favor, you're making a political decision. I think these are tough choices. I think this is, a, it is an unusual proceeding you've got to do. You've, you've got to weigh a lot of things, uh, I think. You've got to weigh the, 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 the focus of the country. So I don't think this is, even though it's clear to me, Mueller basically said, look, Congress, you know, whether you like it or not, this is in your court. Um, it isn't a no-brainer that they should do this. I do think, though, that every Democrat has to think about a short-term and long-term. As they think about the short-term decision about this uh, and what feels politically correct in the moment, I would just remind them of how a bunch of Democrats debated the Iraq War Resolution back in 2002. The politics of the Iraq War Resolution was one thing uh, in that period of time with an election coming up and patriotic fervor running rampant uh, in a post-9-11 world. And then five years later, that vote is uh, one of the bigger stains you can have as an American politician in the Democratic Party these days. That is what I think all of these politicians have to weigh. Maybe what the founders w would have thought. Maybe what the public expects. But also, what's this going to look like in five years? Chuck, thank you, sir. Barbara McQuaid is also with me, former U.S. attorney, MSNBC legal analyst. And, Barbara, we are uh, unsurprisingly starting to get a reaction from Democratic presidential candidates in addition to Congressman Swalwell. We just heard from there. Uh, Cory Booker. Uh, Tweeting, uh, Bob Mueller's statement makes it clear Congress has a legal and moral obligation to begin impeachment proceedings immediately. We're also getting a statement from uh, Jay Sekulow. Jay Sekulow, of course, uh, counsel to the president, president's attorney there. The announcement by special counsel Mueller that the office is closing and that he is resigning to return to private life puts a period on a two year investigation that produced. No findings of collusion or obstruction against the president. The attorney general conclusively determined that there was no obstruction by the president. In the words of Attorney General Barr, the report identifies no actions that, in our judgment, constitute obstructive conduct. Again, not coming uh, from Jay Sekulow, president, uh, counsel to, to President Trump. I is that how you heard it, Barbara? No, I don't see a period. I see a dash. It's, I'm, I'm done with, with my work, and now, Congress, it's your turn. You know, I know we all um, compliment Robert Mueller on his eloquence, but I wish he were a little less nuanced. Uh, you know, Key and Peele used to have this comedy bit where they did the Obama anger translator. And so um, I'll be Robert Mueller's translator. Here's what I heard him say. There was no hoax. Russia interfered with our election. There's no coup. These people acted in integ with integrity in their investigation. I can't find obstruction.
obstruction of justice because the law says I can't charge a sitting president. But you know who can? Congress can. It's your turn. Read my damn report. It's all there. Um, and Barbara McQuaid, we should also point out that we're giving you 10 additional points for the key and peel reference on this Wednesday morning. <laughs> Thank you. Brett Stevens uh, has also joined me. Brett, of course, a New York Times columnist, also an MSNBC contributor. And, and, and Brett, the, the, the quote that continues to stand out to me from what we heard from Bob Mueller there, uh, if we had confidence that the president clearly did not commit a crime, we would have said so. Do, do we think that what we just heard from, from Bob Mueller there at the top of the hour, that nine-minute statement, no questions, do we think that is in any way, shape, or form um, going to help us move forward, or is this going to create even more questions now? I think it creates a great many questions, and I think Mueller has a responsibility if he's subpoenaed by Congress to testify in any setting that Congress uh, demands that he, now that he's a, especially now that he's a private citizen and not working for uh, the Justice Department, that seems to me all, all the more the case. The argument that I can't that he can't say anything beyond the 448 pages of the report just strikes me as untrue. There are major questions that have to be answered, not least with his differences with the Attorney General Bob Barr um, that came out that surfaced with with uh, with that letter he wrote uh, uh, he wrote to the Attorney General. What I did hear M Mueller saying pretty clearly is. Is I'm not going to be your messiah. I'm not going to be the guy who stands on high to deliver a verdict. Ultimately, this is a, like all impeachment cases, this is a confluence of legal, uh, of, of legal issues and political and ethical judgments that only Congress itself can, uh, uh, can resolve. People keep looking to Bob Mueller to sort of give us the answer, and he, 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 he demurred. That being said, I still think he has an obligation to testify. Adding to our list of Democratic presidential contenders who are responding now, uh, California Democrat Kamala Harris, who spoke to our own Vaughn Hillier just a few moments ago. Take a listen. The prosecution of a sitting president would unconstitutionally undermine the capacity of the executive branch to perform its constitutionally assigned functions. Should that be DOJ policy? And should the special counsel have sought to charge President Trump with obstruction of justice? All right, so look, I think what we are clear about is that we learned a few things today. And most importantly, what we learned is that the special counsel did not return an indictment because of that memo. In other words, but for that memo, I believe the, a fair inference from what we heard from Bob Mueller is that there would have been indictments returned against this president. And the other thing we learned today is that the current Attorney General of the United States misled the American people when he spoke about his conversation with Bob Mueller and suggested that Bob Mueller said no. It had nothing to do with but for that memo. There wasn't enough there. So these are the issues that are now, I think, um, very clear. And the bottom line is, one, we have got to now let the process, you know, start its course around Congress acting on what we know is, is essentially indictable um, evidence and information. Should it be policy, DOJ policy, the inability to indict a sitting president? I think that the, it, if I were president, I would ask and hope that the attorney general and a t an attorney general who actually had justice in mind instead of covering up for the president, um, I would hope and ask that she would put in place a, a, a procedure of questioning whether that memo is actually um, necessary and applicable when we have a situation such as this. Because after all, remember, it's an advisory memo. It's not the law. Senator, Senator, time Senator. For one more. what was the message that Mr. Mueller was sending to you, a sitting member of Congress. And do you have a reaction to uh, the president's tweet saying that this case is closed and nothing has changed? Well, I, I don't, I try not to respond to those tweets, but I will say that I think what is clear is that um, it's, I think it's a fair inference from what we heard in that press conference that Bob Mueller was essentially referring impeachment to the United States Congress. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Kamala Harris, upstate South Carolina, on the heels of that town hall last night here on MSNBC. Uh, just a few minutes here left. Uh, we'll come back out to you here, Brett, for, for a moment. Is, is that what you heard from, from Bob Mueller? Was he calling on Congress to essentially do something? Well, he was calling. He was saying that this is not in my hands. It's in Congress's hands. I don't know. I, I mean, the statement was somewhat 
I guess oracular is is the word. Do something can also mean doing nothing, lay, uh, 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 laying it to rest. I mean, he made it clear that he was not uh, he was not exonerate that the report did not exonerate the president. But there's a great you know there's a great question as to then what what that do something ought to be, and there are a range of options uh, before the uh, before the Congress, by the way, which are not simply impeachment or 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 doing nothing. There's also some, such a thing as, as censure, which is one of the things that Democrats were recommending against uh, President Clinton 21 years ago uh, in during during the saga of his of his uh, of, of his own impeachment. So this is a judgment that's both legal as well as political that only the Congress itself uh, uh, can determine. I mean, if I were offering Democrats in Congress advice, to the extent that they take it, I'd say censure is a good bet because it allows a lot of Republicans to get on record censuring the president without ending up in an impeachment process that might end up helping him politically. Well, Bert Stevens, we're going to have to leave it there. Big thanks to you. Big thanks to all of my guests and panelists. Uh, roughly an hour ago, special counsel Bob Mueller stepped to the microphone, spoke for roughly nine minutes, announced that he was... Uh, Stepping away from the special counsel's office to return to private life, uh, did not take any questions, but left a lot of answer. Or excuse me, did not take any questions, but left a number of questions out there. Andrew Mitchell will try and answer some of them coming up. I'll see you tomorrow morning on Today. And good day. I'm Andrea Mitchell in Washington, continuing our breaking news, our coverage here in Washington, where after more than two years, Robert Mueller just broke his silence, announcing his resignation as special counsel, saying he hopes and expects this will be his last spoken word on the subject, but not exonerating the president. As set forth in the report after that investigation, if we had had confidence that the president clearly did not commit a crime, we would have said so. We did not, however, make a determination as to whether the president did commit a crime. In that excerpt from the report, Mueller also saying for the first time that from the outset of the probe, under Justice Department rules, his office could not indict a sitting president, but indicating that now it is up to Congress. The opinion says that the Constitution requires a process other than the criminal justice system to formally accuse a sitting president of wrongdoing. And beyond department policy, we were guided by principles of fairness. It would be unfair to potentially, it would be unfair to potentially accuse somebody of a crime when there can be no court resolution of the actual charge. So that was Justice Department policy. Those were the principles under which we operated. And from them, we concluded that we would would not reach a determination one way or the other about whether the president committed a crime. That is the office's, that is the office's final position, and we will not comment on any other conclusions or hypotheticals about the president. Mueller also made it clear he does not want to testify before Congress. I hope and expect this to be the only time that I will speak to you in this manner. I am making that decision myself. No one has told me whether I can or should testify or speak further about this matter. There has been discussion about an appearance before Congress. Any testimony from this office would not go beyond our report. It contains our findings and analysis and the reasons for the decisions we made. We chose those words carefully and the work speaks for itself. And the report is my testimony. I would not provide information beyond that which is already public in any appearance before Congress. I do not believe it is appropriate for me to speak further about the investigation or to comment on the actions of the Justice Department or Congress. And it's for that reason I will not be taking questions today as well. And after that dramatic statement, Pete Williams, of course, was in the room. Let's get the very latest from our justice correspondent, Pete Williams, NBC Justice and National Security correspondent, Julia Ainsley, outside the Justice Department as well. At the White House, we have Peter Alexander and NBC Intelligence and National Security correspondent, Ken Delanian. 
NBC Capitol Hill correspondent Casey Hunt, MSNBC Justice and Security Analyst Matt Miller, and MSNBC National Security Analyst Jeremy Bash, former Chief of Staff at the CIA and the Pentagon. Pete, first to you. Um, you've known Robert Mueller for a long time. You've covered him for a very long time. Uh, this was very dramatic. His statement, to, to me, appeared halting. You could understand the pressure he's under. Um, your first impressions, your headlines. Well, I think you've hit the high points. Number one, uh, he made it clear he doesn't want to testify before Congress. He said there's no point in it. He's not going to go beyond what's in his testimony. I hope this is my last statement about it, he said. So quite clear he's laying a marker down that it's his decision and his decision alone that nobody's telling him what he can or cannot do, that he doesn't want to testify before Congress. The report speaks for itself. So this was an, end, this was a, an important inflection point in the career of this special counsel investigation. It's now completely over. The report largely ended it. He had some finishing up to do. Now he is no longer or shortly will no longer be the special counsel. He goes back to private life. Uh, the second point I thought was interesting today is, and you touched on it as well, it seems pretty clear now that in terms of the process, the special counsel's office made the decision from the outset that they could not charge the president with a crime, even if they found evidence of it. We had thought, reading the report, that maybe they assembled it all and said, okay, now let's see, can we charge him with the crime? Oops, I guess we can. That's not the way it worked. It's quite clear that they knew that going in. Uh, his summary of the report, though, doesn't go an inch beyond what the report says. It is a, a very accurate summary of what, of what the report said. I did think it was interesting that given this report is 440 plus pages long, he did choose to pull out of it what is a very brief mention plus a footnote in section two of the report on obstruction when he said the opinion, meaning the Justice Department opinion that he can't charge the president with a crime, the opinion says the Constitution requires a process other than the criminal justice system to formally accuse a sitting president of, of wrongdoing. Um, and back to your original question, Andrea, uh, yes, I remember about when Bob Mueller first came onto the job in the, uh, literally the days before 9-11, following him through his uh, remarkable 12-year career as director of the FBI and then in private life. He's 74 years old now, uh, and I would say today uh, he showed every evidence of being a 74-year-old man uh, who's probably eager to return to private life.